today's headlines, let's go over to the CBN News Desk. Gordon, President Biden is set to take executive action today to provide limited protection for access to abortion as he faces mounting pressure from Democrats to be more forceful on the subject after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, sending the issue back to the states. And as CBN's Brody Carter reports, the battles over abortion are heating up in multiple states. The Supreme Court's ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade is expected to lead to abortion bans in roughly half the states, 13 of which have already initiated so-called trigger laws banning the procedure. Now some states that want to protect abortion are taking action. For now, it's up to the states to determine whether women get reproductive health care. And in North Carolina, they still can. In North Carolina, Governor Roy Cooper signed an executive order Wednesday to protect both abortion providers as well as women who've crossed state lines to get an abortion. North Carolina is an outlier state in the South that could see a surge of women from surrounding states who want to get an abortion. Your zip code should not determine your rights. And Colorado's governor said the state won't cooperate with other states' abortion investigations signing its executive order to protect women and abortion clinics from being disciplined. Lawyers there are already building a defense. Those kind of prosecutions are going to look like first degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter. Then you have all the providers who are assisting. You've got aiding and abetting of those crimes, which are also very serious crimes. And in Mississippi. More protesters clashed Thursday outside the Jackson Women's Health Organization, the state's only abortion clinic. Mississippi's trigger law has closed the clinic's doors for good, leaving emotions running high. Men are the evil here. The clinic will move to New Mexico, although it is appealing the law to the state Supreme Court. And another legal case, this one in Kentucky. Two abortion clinics are in circuit court trying to block the state's near total ban on abortion. A judge issued a temporary restraining order stopping the ban last week. If granted, the injunction would suspend the state law while the case is litigated. Brody Carter, CBN News. Turning now to Asia, where the former Japanese prime minister was assassinated today, Shinzo Abe, a conservative and one of his nation's most powerful and influential figures, died after being shot during a campaign speech in western Japan. The 67-year-old Abe was shot from behind minutes after he started his speech. He was airlifted to a hospital for emergency treatment, but was not breathing and his heart had stopped. He was pronounced dead later at the hospital, according to NHK Public Television. Police arrested the suspected gunman at the scene. The attack shocked many in Japan, which is one of the world's safest nations and has some of the strictest gun control laws anywhere. Abe was Japan's longest serving leader before stepping down in 2020. If you live in China, Big Brother is watching you. More than 415 million surveillance cameras track the population 24-7. And when you add in digital currency, social security cards, monitored smartphones, and more, you have what's being called the perfect police state. George Thomas brings us the disturbing details. In 2013, China's President Xi Jinping said that whoever controls data has the upper hand. Ever since, Xi has been on a technological quest to build what some call a blueprint for a digital dictatorship. It would not only allow China's communist government to control huge volumes of data on its own citizens, but also of those around the world. Dustin Carmack worked as chief of staff for the director of national intelligence. You're talking that, you know, vast amounts of data. They are running between both either covert or overt, you know, cyber attacks and other realms. They are sucking up massive amounts of data around the globe that could have nefarious purposes in the long run. China has more than 415 million surveillance cameras deployed throughout the country, making its population by far the world's most watched. And now Beijing is using digital currency, social security cards, social credit systems, and online interactions to keep an even closer eye on its citizens. It is a massive dragnet based on artificial intelligence, uh, facial recognition, voice recognition. These are all novel technologies that the Chinese Communist Party is deploying against its people. Jeffrey Kane, author of the new book, The Perfect Police State, 
an undercover odyssey into China's terrifying surveillance dystopia of the future, says the regime first tested this type of surveillance several years ago to monitor Uyghurs, an ethnic Muslim group living in the western part of the country. It's a place where everything they do from morning to night, from the, from the moment that they eat breakfast or go to the market or go to work, Everything is monitored by their smartphones, by, by government cameras everywhere. There are millions of government cameras in this region. Um, and nothing is private, nothing is secret. Your entire life is exposed. Kane says his investigation found that those reams of data are fed to a massive police database. And with the help of artificial intelligence, attempts to predict whether or not someone will commit a crime in the future. But the thing is that the system has gotten out of control because... Uh, you know, it, so I, I looked at a list of reasons that people can be detained for these pre-crimes. Um, and, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, they, they bought a tent suddenly or they, you know, they stopped smoking suddenly. Um, they, they change their behavior in ways that the system finds odd. And then so it nudges the police. It sends the police a little, um, you know, on the app, a, a nudge to, you know, go to this person's house, to their work, to check them out, maybe interrogate them a little bit. And if the situation calls for it, take them away to one of many hundreds of concentration camps. China is accused of committing genocide against the Uyghurs by holding more than a million of them in what Beijing calls re-education camps. The Associated Press gaining exclusive access to one such detention center this summer that allegedly had room enough to hold more than 10,000 prisoners. When we talk about genocide, it's not just about taking lives, which there's evidence to suggest that's occurring too, but it's to erase a population, an ethnic group, and that's what they're after. Sophie Richardson with Human Rights Watch says President Xi also wants China to be the global leader in exporting its authoritarian surveillance tech to other like-minded regimes. So when they've got the kinds of tools that allow them, for example, to track their critics uh, every movement and control their access, for example, to money or even to buying plane or train tickets, you know, it, makes, it, make, it can make a state exponentially more powerful. New research from Oxford University and Berlin's Humboldt University uncovered some 1,800 active Chinese surveillance devices across 72 countries including Venezuela, Kenya, Philippines, and Oman. China is now using their influence, their money, uh, their technology to facilitate the repression of minorities and, and individuals in other countries. China has also deployed censorship devices in 17 other countries, among them Turkey, Cuba, Egypt, and Pakistan, where news and media websites are blocked. I think the overall effect is to use technology to engineer a very particular kind of dissent-free society. And that's a very frightening concept. China used these and other tactics to suppress protesters in Hong Kong, then came to Cuba's aid in July by cutting communications after tens of thousands took to the streets protesting the regime. That type of technology being used to, to throttle uh, internet traffic flows or at times uh, in Cuba actually turn off the internet, especially in the early days of some of the protests down there. Meanwhile, new research shows that technology made by seven American companies, including IBM, Microsoft and Oracle, are facilitating China's surveillance of Uyghur Muslims with little to no consequences. I think that a lot of American companies have been caught with their pants down, frankly, because um, they spent the past two decades warming up to China, looking for market and business opportunities, profit opportunities, um, and now they've realized that they're, they're making a deal with the devil. A deal that is handing China a treasure trove of data in its quest for global information superiority and digital control over its citizens and those around the world. George Thomas, CBN News. Those are today's top stories from CBN News. Beaten and tortured, that's what an attorney suffered who fought for Christians in communist Romania. Then after she personally humiliated the dictator, she thought it was the end of the line. An assassin came to her office and pointed a gun at her head. Abigail Robertson tells us what happened next. Virginia Proden doesn't hide the fact that she should be dead. 
In her book, Saving My Assassin, she tells the incredible story of death staring her in the face and how she fought back with nothing but the Word of God. I am not a hero. God gave me this mission and I was a tool in God's hands. Why did the Romanian government want you killed? Because I defended Christian and human rights cases. And uh, a government, um, socialist government, it's a government who will um, establish a system where the government eats your God, not Christ. During dictator Nicolae Ceausescu's rule in the 1980s, Christians found with Bibles or sharing Christ with others were thrown in jail, even though the country had religious freedom laws. I was told in the interrogation room uh, that those laws were in to protect freedom of religion and freedom of speech. They were in the law books of Romania for the Western civilization to believe that we have freedom. But Virginia used those laws to fight the government anyway. Later on, I found out that when I was in the courtroom facing the judge and the persecutors, behind me there were representatives from America, from France, Italy, Jewish, Israel, all over the Western Europe who will take notes and send it to their government. So for that reason, I'm alive and I'm not dead because God protected me. Virginia caught the attention of Western journalists from places like Free Europe and Voice of America. The government had to let me be present at this. Otherwise, they had to respond. Where is she? What is the situation and so forth? But outside the courtroom, the government took its revenge by beating and torturing her. I remember full of blood, full of pain, as many of them were hitting me and so forth. I looked straight up to them and I said, I don't like what you're doing, but God loves you and I choose to love you. And they had to turn their faces because they were crying. Through it all, Virginia was winning her religious liberty cases. Then came her biggest test. It was so risky that when I received this assi that assignment, I said, Lord, you give them a chance to actually pick up the gun and kill me. I received documents um, that will prove that the dictator was lying, continuing to lie to America. Trusting in the Lord, she accepted. I took the job and uh, later on at night, I created a pocket in my suit and I put my documents there uh, with the intention to give it to the American embassy the next day because I had a case and I knew that they would be in, in the courtroom. Miraculously, her plan worked. They took me, interrogated me, but that day they forgot to search me. The documents made it to President Ronald Reagan, infuriating the Romanian dictator. He decided to send a client to my office the assassin, said to me, I'm not your client, I'm here to kill you. And he pointed the gun to me. And I thought that I'm gonna die. As the assassin screamed at her, Virginia fought back the only way she knew how. I look at the man and I started to share the gospel. He was just a human being like me, looking for the truth like I used to look many years ago. And as I shared the gospel with him, I notice, I look at the man who screamed a few seconds ago, melting in under God's power. Instead of taking her life, he accepted Christ. He left my office as a free man indeed, as a, as a brother in Christ, mm -hmm. and our lives will never be the same. Virginia's book includes a chapter from her would-be assassin on how God transformed his life after their divine encounter even leading him into ministry. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, that's an incredible story, incredible bravery, but more importantly, incredible love. When you look at the world today, what's happening right now in Hong Kong, what has been happening in China, what has been happening in India, what has been happening in the Middle East and North Africa, you look at these stories of Christian persecution, 
Uh, and we need to have love like never before. Uh, and you, you look at, the, at what she did. Here's an assassin screaming at her, pointing a gun. And she says, no, I love you. I want to sh share some really good news with you, how you can be free of hatred and, and these things that so destroy us. This is love, and she's got it. Love each other deeply with all your heart. That's what the Apostle Pe Pe Peter said. He said it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Love each other deeply. And she decided to love her enemies. Just when she was being persecuted, when she was beaten, beaten when she had a gun pointed at her, she chose to love, and in that fulfilled this wonderful verse, love never fails. If you want to get a copy of the book, it's available nationwide. Trading Karch's nickname was Big Shot. His golf coach started calling him that because of his knack for coming through in the clutch. After a terrible car crash left Traden with a crushed skull, Big Shot was going to have to beat the odds one more time. The impact was deafening. A truck failing to yield the right of way broadsided the van carrying Jerry Higgins and his two grandchildren, Say and Trayden Karch. I heard Say say, Trayden, wake up, Trayden, wake up. Jerry and his granddaughter were okay. 13-year-old Trayden, however. His uh, uh, skull had been crushed. And then it wasn't very long and the uh, paramedics were there. That's when I called Amanda. He was unconscious and he said there was just blood everywhere and that he kind of had a few seizures. I just cried out to God and I said, God, you knew this was going to happen. It didn't catch you by surprise. And so I trust you. I know that he's in your hands and you're in complete control. Manda arrived at St. Francis Hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma shortly after trading. He was barely alive. And then I just started texting everyone I knew and just saying, we need you to pray. Trayden's dad, Chris, got to the ER moments before his son was taken to surgery. There was a lot of blood, and I, I definitely was not expecting to see all the blood. It made it very real, the, the severity of the, the situation. The doctors and the nurses had all told us that they thought he would live for maybe 24 hours. As the hours passed, the waiting room filled up with family and friends praying for the teenager. So that was a blessing, you know, to have just so many people automatically praying for him. As for Chris and Manda, memories flooded in of the fun-loving seventh grader who less than a year earlier sunk the winning putt for his team at the Junior PGA Regional Final. That was really exciting for him because he wasn't the best by a long shot on their team. I said, but look at what God did for you. I said, how he let you make that winning putt. Trading Kurt. Now they were begging God for their son's life. They also reached out through social media. It was a desperate plea, basically just saying, if you're a praying person, please pray. I need as many people praying to God as I possibly can. Be with Amanda and Chris. Trayden survived the six-hour surgery and was placed in a medically induced coma. My heart aches for them. The doctors came in and said, we have done everything we can possibly do for Trayden. There's nothing more medically that we can do for him. The rest is up to Trayden. We really had no idea what was going to happen, or if he was going to wake up. Well, he'll never talk or walk. He'll be kind of in a vegetative state. Prayers and encouragement came in from everywhere on social media, including the PGA. In fact, one of Traden's favorite golfers, Rory McIlroy, sent him a personal message. And I wish you a really speedy recovery. Golf in the PGA Junior League really need you. And when you're feeling better, I want you to come to a tournament and Meet me and we can hang out and hopefully we'll see you soon. With Traden still in a coma, the family clung to the outpouring of love and their faith in God. Then three weeks after surgery, the swelling in his brain had gone down and he woke up. He starts sitting up on his own and then 
only a week later does he start walking around the hospital with assistants. Each day they would see his progress. They would just, every doctor would come in and just say how he was a miracle. After only five weeks in the hospital, Trayden was released to go to rehab. Trayden actually walked out of the hospital on his own. Still, Trayden faced major hurdles. He couldn't speak and had lost his memory. As he worked with the rehab staff just to form sounds, the family again turned to prayer. Within a week, they saw more signs of God's healing. Trayden had spoke my name for the very first time. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. He couldn't actually say words, and so he was sounding out each letter to my name, just to mom. <laughs> and when Chris brought Trayden's putter to him, that's when I knew I was like, it, that part has, has stayed because he gripped it the exact same way. And we were, you know, we were excited about that. That's six in a row. Two months after the accident, Trayden went home. His speech and memory continued to improve as he had to relearn everything he had learned since kindergarten. By fall, he was back in school and finished the seventh grade that year. By then, he had watched Rory McElroy's message dozens of times. He also got to meet him. I remember he walked in, and my mind was like, huh, is this really him? And sure enough, it was. At 17, Traden shows little sign of speech or memory impairment, and he looks forward to graduating in 2022. He's also back on the golf course and challenging his dad whenever he can. I was there. I heard the prognosis, and, and I knew what we were looking at. God healed Trayton, there's no doubt. In my opinion, the only reason why I'm still alive is people praying. There is so much power in prayer. I mean, I believe that we have the same power. We can call upon the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And so you have to call upon that power. You can call upon the same power that raised Christ from the dead. What Trayden's mother is quoting, she's quoting from the Bible, that that same resurrection power is not some faraway place. The Apostle Paul said that same resurrection power is in you. Now, Paul was talking from personal experience. In the book of Acts, it talks about him being taken outside the city and stoned to death. So they're throwing heavy rocks at him. And the disciples come out, the Christians come out after the crowd was finished and they pray over Paul and he rises back up and he does something unusual. He walks back into the city. Paul knew what that resurrection power because he had experienced it. Here at Trayton, he knows that res resurrection power because he's experienced it. He's experienced a complete recovery. Realize that same resurrection power is available to you, and it's not in some far-off place. It's right within you. If you have received Jesus into your heart, you have the resurrected one inside you, his power is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All we have to do is believe it and release it and have faith to believe for that. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth to show himself strong. He showed himself strong for trading. He responded to the prayer of faith. Even though the doctor said it was impossible, with God all things are possible. So we're going to pray, and we're going to believe for you, and we're going to believe for that resurrection power to be released. Before we pray, we want to encourage you, because here's some other miracles. Here's Eileen uh, from New York. She suffered with Achilles tendonitis and Achilles heel. She finally made an appointment to see a pot podiatrist. And then while she was waiting, she was watching the 700 Club. And Terry had a word of knowledge for someone with her exact condition. Eileen shouted to her husband, she's talking about an Achilles heel. Well, the next day, 
Eileen had absolutely no pain. She canceled her doctor's appointment, called the CBN's prayer line to tell us she's still pain free. And if you ever have had tendonitis or tendinosis or that kinds of thing, you know that's a miracle. Uh, God is in the miracle business and he's in it for you. What do you have? Well, this is another one. It's been well over a year since Linda of San Marco, Texas had had knee surgery. But even after the surgery, she still suffered from pain, couldn't walk normally. She had lost a significant amount of tissue around her knee. While watching the 700 Club, Gordon, she heard you say, God is reconstructing things in that knee. You just felt something move within, and that is the hand of God, touching, healing, and restoring the joint. Realize now that you can put weight on that joint. You can now move that joint. You can stand up and have the confidence that you are healed. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Well, by faith, Linda claimed God's healing. Within three days, her, day, her knee was normal. This isn't just her opinion. Her doctor confirmed the wow. healing via x-rays, and now she is walking normally and wow. giving all glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. God's healing stands up to x-rays. God's healing stands up to medical experts and say, no, you're wrong. I'm coming in, I'm making a difference, I'm raising this one up. Let that be you, and let it be you right now. Realize there's nothing you need to do to qualify yourself. You are a child of God. The breath that God gave to Adam is in you, and he wants to breathe on you again to give you new life, new health, a resurrection today. So Terry and I are going to agree. Now, what we want you to do is show an act of faith. In an act of faith, lay your hand on that area of the body that is, needs healing. We'll agree with you. And the Bible says, when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done. So let's just trust that and let's pray. Lord, we come to you. And in an act of faith, we lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. We come into agreement over it. We come into agreement that by your stripes, we are healed, that you've already accomplished everything we need. By faith, we say the resurrection power that brought you back from the dead is in us and able to resurrect us and do mighty things. So in Jesus' name, body be healed now and be restored and be made whole. Any infirmity be gone now in Jesus' name. Any disease, any infection, any cancer, remove yourself now. You have no place in my body. In Jesus' name, I am healed. Now, Lord, I thank you for what you are doing, what you have done, and what you will do. I thank you for it. I thank you for what you have already accomplished, and I receive it now in Jesus' name. There's someone, your name is Amos, and you're laying hands on both of your knees, and you've got tremendous pain in both knees. In the name of Jesus, be healed and be restored. Let all that pain just dissipate away. Let the... the um, uh, all the cartilage and the cushioning in the knee be restored. Let there be full and complete and pain-free function from this moment forward in Jesus' name. Terry? Mm -hmm. There's someone, you have a deformity on your spine. Um, anyway, God's healing that for you. He's just correcting it. You've had it your whole life, and it, because it's a deformity that's been there so long, you haven't even thought to pray about it, but today God's healing your spine for you, and you're going to know it. Your freedom to move is going to change. And there are many of you who have issues with breathing, and you're it's not COVID-19, but you're fearful of that because of your breathing issues. God is healing that for you right now. Breath of heaven, blow into lungs right now and heal in Jesus' name. There's someone you've got a fractured tailbone and coccyx and, and there's swelling and inflammation and a tremendous amount of pain. You can't sit. Um, God is just healing that. What the doctors say they can't do God is doing for you right now. He's resetting that bone and taking that break completely away. 
all of that pain just left you, all of the swelling, all of the inflammation. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Lord God Almighty, we thank you. We thank you for your many gifts to us. We don't deserve any of them, but you love us, and you love us so much you want us restored to you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that gets an answer. So we're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're a phone call away. 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The co-founder of the South African Satanic Church stepped down from his position in May after his heart was overwhelmed with the love of Jesus. He was involved in Christian ministry 20 years ago before becoming an atheist. He explained that he turned against Satanism after recently experiencing unconditional love from Christians. He said a Christian woman hugged him and loved him after he said he did not believe Jesus existed. And after that, he said Jesus appeared to him while he was doing a satanic ritual and flooded him with love. You can read his full story and watch the video on CBNNews.com. CBN's Operation Blessing is providing medical help to those in need around the world. In Nigeria, 17-year-old Khalil had severe burns on his left foot after a bad car accident. His foot grew deformed and he couldn't walk properly or even wear shoes. His parents with six children are poor and could not afford surgery. Then his uncle saw an ad for Operation Blessing's life-changing surgery program. Operation Blessing supporters contributed to a special campaign to provide Khalil with the surgery. Now he dreams of becoming a pharmacist, and his dad said, I want to thank Almighty God for using your organization to help my son. It's a great story on this Friday. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back right after this. John and Amy have enough children to field, field a baseball team. They're raising nine and doing so on one salary. The couple say life gets chaotic at times, and here's the secret to how they manage it all. As the parents of nine children, John and Amy McHugh say life is never boring. To me, it's like a NASCAR race without any brakes and with no finish line. So it's full speed all the time. But you know, it, it, you get these quiet moments that are lovely. Years ago, when Amy was pregnant with her first daughter, she left her full-time job as a teacher. Even though the family was struggling financially, the McHugh's tithed, a practice they learned from their church. It didn't seem like it was ever gone. You didn't miss it. John was working in construction and doing handyman work on the side. Over the years, he began receiving periodic raises. Meanwhile, their family grew to three children. At that time, Amy started watching the 700 Club. The kids wanted to give. They liked that CBN was helping other people. So I'm like, oh, I want to give. And they're like, we do too. And so we just did it. Michaela, now in her 20s, recalls those days. It seemed like such a small thing, but it had such a large impact. Amy says that during this time, God provided even beyond her family's basic needs. They go to a garage sale and the free box would have exactly the poly pockets that Michaela wanted. He just showed them that he was their provider. In 2013, John's side job was doing so well, he decided to focus on it full time. The job started coming in, the phone started ringing. We were faithful from day one. Increments and increments. If you trust with a little, trust with a little bit more, how about a little bit more? And that's where God has kept us. He's kind of just walked with us the whole way. The McHughes continued to tithe, and recently John received his largest contract to date. That alone amounted to his annual salary from just a few years ago. I, I don't really even know how I got from small to big. And, you know, it's, I know it's not me because everybody goes, oh, you do this. I'm like, no, I don't do anything. God does it all. I just, I just show up. Even though they're raising nine kids on one income, the McHughes never stopped giving to CBN. We like giving to CBN because it, it's an opportunity. CBN can do with my money a lot more than what I could do myself. Like, I'd love to build churches, right? That'd be a great opportunity, but I can only do one thing. By investing in CBN, 
look at the huge ministry and you know, all the countries, all the locations. They can do things I couldn't dream about, but I'm still involved because I give financially, allowing them to support that ministry. So to me, it's a great investment in the kingdom of God. The McHughes say they've learned the importance of giving and want to share it with others. God says, you know, try me in this. It's the only place in the Bible where he says, try me. You give to God first, and we want to teach the children that. You instill it to them young and early, and they see the blessings, they see the return on that, and uh, they're going to continue to. I'll say it again, tithing works. It's, uh, it's incredible how it works. It's not some on again, off again thing. When you have a lifetime of giving to say, I want to put God first in my life. I want to, uh, my, I want everyone to know. I want my children to know. I want to know God is first. And when you do that, the blessings just seem to multiply and multiply and multiply. These blessings aren't for things for your own enjoyment. What these blessings are for so you can have even more to give to others, to be there for them in their time of need. And whether that's raising nine children on your own with one salary or, or helping people around the world, that's the purpose. That's why God gives you the power to get wealth, not so that you can consume it on your own, so you can have even more to share with others. That is the wonderful secret. Jesus laid it out. We call it the law of reciprocity. Give, and it will be given unto you. What is God looking for? He's looking for you to put it into action. It's not wait until you have and then give. No, it's give, and then it will be given unto you. If you want to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, and say, yes, I want to join in everything you're doing around the world, whether it's Operation Blessing, Orphan's Promise, helping the home front, our international broadcast, you're a part of all of it when you join the 700 Club. How much is it? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. If you're already a 700 Club member, I encourage you to go up to 700 Club Gold. That's $40 a month. We also have a 1,000 Club. That's $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. The bank is doing all the work, and we can send as our gift to you, Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call or go to CBN.com. Terry? A shot of tequila at 8 a.m. That's how Erin Andrews' bout with alcoholism began. Little did she know the depth of the depression behind her drinking and that eventually it would take her somewhere she never dreamed she'd go. I never thought you know, at any point during my growing up that I would end up in a mental institution. My whole life has led to this moment. Like, how disappointing. I always um, thought of Christians as like these really emphatic people who wanted me to basically just turn away from anything that was fun. If we're bad, we get punished by God because, you know, it's good, so he can't stand bad. I had this distant, arbitrary view of God. I went to a Christian college. If you go to chapel three times a week and you know you dress up every day and you're really smart and you get all A's and you work hard and everybody likes you and you're doing all the right things and you have this bright future. So I kind of just thought, I'm gonna believe in God in my head, but I'm just gonna do my own thing. The minute I'm out of my house and I have the opportunity to go to this party and you know drink at 18, I'm like, oh yeah, like I've never done that. That'll be fun. Like I'm gonna try some new thing. It kind of felt edgy because I was like breaking the law and I was breaking the rules there, but I just had fun with it. And then a long pattern of that, you know, thinking that I could just keep doing it and it would never catch up to me when I was 19 and I was a sophomore in college. Like I was taking, you know, a shot of tequila like at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. It became a little bit too consistent. And I never really thought about the term alcoholism. I didn't really think about the term depression. Like that was not the thing that I was thinking of. I was just thinking, oh, this is something I gotta do to get to the day. And then on the outside, you know, I'm posting pictures with my friends like, I'm so happy and I'm smiling. I could almost feel myself, like my health, my mental health, my physical health deteriorating. So, as a teenager, 
I had heard about self-harm, like from my friends and stuff. And I thought like when I was 17, you know, maybe I'll just try it one time. And you know, the minute I saw like the blood, it was like, it, it's hooked. It was like this dopamine hit. And in a really twisted way, I'd almost reward myself with self-harming. I'd look down at my arms and my legs and I'd realize like, that's actually not real. Like I actually don't like who I am at all. As the alcoholism progressed, the urge to self-harm got so much stronger. And I felt too like, even if God loves me, he's not gonna wanna associate with me too much because look at where I've ended up. So when I go home for Christmas break after fall semester, all these fillings just started coming out and I couldn't control them. And I remember my parents asked me like for the first time, they said, are you depressed? And I told them no. So I go back spring semester and I couldn't keep it all in. You know, it just, it had started to unravel inside of me. But this thought kept occurring to me, it was just death, you know, death. Like I could just end this, I don't have to do this. It's just very strong and I'm thinking about it all the time. And I remember one night I decided I just have to try, at least have to try one time. And so I remember taking the razor, slitting my wrist and um, nothing happened. So I just kept going and I just kept going. And finally, I'm surrounded by blood, but I'm not bleeding out. And um, I realized, like, I don't think this is gonna work. I, I'd broken my razors, like there was nothing left for me to use. My friend kind of came in and she sort of put an end to what I was trying to do. And I think that that was the first time I really cried <laughs> in a long time. So, you know, when you try to do something like that, you can't just go back to normal life. Um, I had to be institutionalized for a week after that. And I remember I just cried and I cried and I thought, I have never, ever been this low. This is where I've ended up. My whole life has led to this moment. Like how disappointing, you know, when you're 19 years old and you want your whole future to be like gleaming. And at 19, you're realizing, oh my gosh, like I don't really have much going for me. I sort of let go of like my stubbornness because I realized, you know, my plan actually wasn't better than God's plan. Like even if God's plan wasn't that good, it had to be better than this because this is really not good. And I remember waking up the next day and I went into like the room where all the patients kind of hang out and there was a group of nursing students there. And like, lo and behold, this guy kind of comes out of the blue and he sits down next to me. He said immediately to me, like, I feel like God wants me to talk to you. And I thought, okay, is this guy crazy? I'm not sure, you know? And he said, um, you know, I can feel your pain. Like I can feel like what's coming off of you. And I want you to know God loves you and he hasn't left you. And he told me to read my Bible every day, which was so weird because that was something I used to do when I was like a teenager. So he told me, you know, start in Psalms, like start in the book of Psalms, go through Psalms. And when you're done, go through the gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I remember feeling like, you know, if he can say that, you know, that means something good's gonna come out of my life. And I don't know what that is, but I know that it, it's better than this. And so what he gave me that day was just a lot of hope. This vision of myself, like getting out of there and maybe doing something good with my life, it gave me a reason to try to get better. It gave me a reason to stop drinking. Like finally, I had the possibility of something better. And so when I went back to school for junior year, I finally made a point, like, I'm just gonna read one chapter every day, like he told me. The first day, obviously nothing changed too much. The second day, nothing changed too much, but over time, I saw things in my life kind of started coming together and my eyes started being open to a lot of things. I was still self-harming. That was still something I struggled with. Um, depression was still something I'd struggled with. Those things did not go away immediately. But over time, you know, I felt like, oh, I'm being led to the right doctor and, you know, this medication is probably gonna help me. Over that first semester, I don't really know when it stopped. I don't know when like the last time I cut was. But I remember looking down kind of at the end of the year and realizing I haven't cut in a really long time. And I don't even see any scars on my arms anymore, which was incredible to me because I was told that they would never go away. And now I'm looking down at my skin and like there's nothing there. I came to this realization that 
Like my faith is not something that I go to when I'm feeling strong. It's when I'm feeling weak and it's when I'm feeling vulnerable and it's when I'm feeling like I can't do it anymore. And um, it's just me constantly admitting like my desperation for Jesus because I have nothing else to rely on. I still just read like one chapter every day. I never got <laughs> fancier than that. It's the first thing I do when I get up because if I don't do that, like I don't know who I am. I think what I would want people to know is sometimes I think you get to the point where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I can't do this anymore. And I think that that's where God desires to come in. The only thing that can really fix your brokenness is Jesus. You know, sometimes when you were young, we follow a lot of the rules, a lot of the guidelines, a lot of the things we're told by our parents, by our church, by our school. And, and after a while, we feel like we're just performing. But have you ever heard somebody say that they perform for an audience of one? It's because they've realized that none of that performance for others holds up. It just doesn't sustain you. But when you come to know Christ in a really personal way, you begin to live for him and in him and he lives through you and it changes things. Erin said something earlier on that was so interesting when she started to um, kind of branch out from the, the safe rule keeping life she'd been living. She said, I thought, well, I'm just going to keep God in my head and in my heart, but I'm going to explore and expand things out here. The Bible says you cannot have two masters, that you will love one and hate the other. And so today, if you're struggling in your walk with the Lord, I just want to encourage you to do what Aaron did. Get into the word, like feed the part of you that is worth growing, that's worth nurturing, that is going to take you somewhere that matters. But don't let the world feed the other part of you. Take control of that. You can. You know, it's even when you get to the place where you're drinking a shot of tequila or something at eight in the morning, you can say, God, I need you to help me right now. I need you to come into my life. I need you to touch my mind and my heart and my very being, even my body, and teach me how to live for an audience of one. I want to please you. I want to walk in your ways. I, I want to be set free from myself and all of the garbage and the temptation that I've allowed to impact my life. I want a fresh beginning today. You know, I don't know what it is that you're faced with in your life, but I do know that when you pray with someone, it makes a difference. We have a prayer line that's available 24 hours a day, and it's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. You can call that number there's a friend who will answer who's standing by to pray with you today. Please do that. Let the power of God be set free in the midst of your heart and your life. We want to leave you today with this verse. It's from Acts chapter 2. But everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's you, my friend. It's never too late. God loves you right where you're at. Call us. We'll pray with you. God bless you.